The Lord be with you. Thank you for that, Linnell. And I've said this before, and I'll probably say it as long as we have such talent that precedes my preaching, that we really got to do something about the order of worship. And, um, and I'll tell you, I, I appreciate that song, Linnell, because here we are, we're standing sort of on the edge, looking over into Advent. It's on the way. Now, I know some of us want to rush to Christmas. In fact, I, you know, I, I've, been, I've been really quiet about the commercials for Christmas already, uh, but it got me the other day, there's a, a, a channel that has the countdown to the 25 days of Christmas. I don't know about you, that sounds like a countdown to a countdown to me. Why don't they just call it what it is and say, we won't show Christmas movies? I don't, I don't know, but in, anyhow, we're, we're on the way to that, and thank you for that, that word this morning, Linnell, that was, that was fitting for the time. We're this morning in Jeremiah chapter 23. Verses 1 through 6, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6 is where we'll be this morning. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may we hear what you would have us to hear, Lord, that we may do what you call us to do, so we may be the people, Lord, that you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So, as I told you earlier in the service, today is what we call, and traditionally in the liturgical calendar, Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday of Pentecost, or ordinary time, which is such a weird way to talk about stuff. Uh, It's the last Sunday of the liturgical year, a Sunday when we reflect on the kingship of Christ, especially as we look forward to the celebration of his birth and the anticipation of the arrival of the King of Kings. But you know, all this, all this talk about kings and, and reading about kings got me wondering, do we really even know anything about what it takes to be a king? I mean, we're all living in 21st century America. We've never had a king over us. The closest we've come to being interested in monarchy is when there's been a royal wedding in the UK, and we're all tuned in, wondering what she's going to wear, wondering what they're going to do. Or the, the closest some of us have gotten is ordering a Reese's Blizzard at Dairy Queen. <laughs> or maybe a Whopper at Burger King. That's the closest most of us get to carrying one iota about royalty. So I wonder, I wonder, what, do we really know what it takes to be a good king, a righteous king? Now, now, I suppose we could just use logic and say, well, it's the same thing it takes to be, to, to be righteous in any form of government, whether it's a monarchy, a democratic republic, a whatever. And we could go down the list. What does it take, though, I wonder, to be a good king? Does it take the kind of charismatic personality to where everybody likes you, to where people will listen to you, to where you'll lead folks out in front? You know, Israel had a king like that. In fact, it was their first king, Saul. Way back 
in 1010 B.C., give or take a year or two. Now, what happened was, you see, all the people, when they came out of Egypt, when they crossed the Red Sea, when they came into the land of Canaan, they really weren't a nation. They were, uh, technically speaking, a loose confederation of tribes. And the one who oversaw them was called a judge. And the judge wasn't really like a, 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 a powerful governor, so to speak. He really just sort of did the divine paperwork. When the tribes would have a little squabble and they couldn't decide it among themselves, they'd go see the judge. And the judge would say, oh, let me think about it. Let me talk to God and I'll get back with you. That was how it worked. Well, they would go out to war. And they'd see these kings, man, they look nice. Come riding in their gold gilded chariots, bedazzled out, blinged out, big crowns, long beards, braided, had spears. Oh, it was nice. They were outfitted, organized. And so they came back to the judge and said, hey, won't you and God get together and get us a king, because we'd like to have a king. Everybody else has a king. We'd like to have one. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 9, they find a king. The first words of that, of that chapter say that there was a man named Kish who had a son named Saul who was the most attractive man in all the land. He was head and shoulders tall above everyone else. That don't mean he was just tall. That's a way of saying if anybody was anybody, it was Saul. You, he'd walk into a room and everybody would pay attention. He'd come in the restaurant, sit down in the booth, and everybody forget what they ordered just to stare at Saul. Saul was it. He was voted most likely to succeed. He was the valedictorian. He was captain of the football. He was everything everybody wanted. That was Saul. Head and shoulders <laughs> Above everyone. The obvious choice, it seemed, to be king. He had that charismatic personality. People would follow him. So the prophet Samuel anointed Saul to be king. And things sort of started to gel together, started to be okay, started to come together. Here was a king. Get him a crown. Get him a palace. Get him, a, get him an army. We got one. Here's Saul. He's king. But as it does, you know the old saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. It didn't take long. Saul was working in connection with the prophet Samuel. Samuel would say, now listen, Saul, I'm going to talk to God, and I'll tell you what God says, and you do it. Samuel said, I think I want, or Saul said, I want to go to war against the Philistines. Samuel said, well, let me, let, me, let me go consort with God. I'll be back in seven weeks, and I'll make the sacrifice for you to go off to war. So Saul paced around. Seven days went by. said, you know what? I'm tired of waiting on the prophet, and he made the sacrifice himself. Samuel walks in, what are you doing? I come with a word from God. You're not, to, you're not to attack the Philistines, but the Amalekites. And when you go to fight the Amalekites, you've got to wipe them all out. So Saul had strike one. He goes in. He fights the Amalekites, wins, kills them all, kills the men, the women, the children, all the puny little livestock, but the nice ones. Well, it wouldn't hurt to keep them back. And the king, well, let's keep the king around because he's a good buddy of mine. Let's just, let's keep him alive. And so it starts. Before long, Saul's ego got the best of him to the point where when the prophet Samuel died, Saul went to a witch at Endor. Now, that's not the planet that has the moon with the Ewoks on it for all of you Star Wars people. He went to Endor and found a witch, conjured up the spirit of Samuel. Crazy story. It's in the Bible. Crazy story. It's all so paranoid. He gets the best of him. He didn't know that God had already taken his blessing away. See, Israel had a king like that. Is that what makes a good king? Someone charismatic out in front leading the way? Maybe not. So what does it take? Does it take somebody with grit? You think somebody who's been there, somebody who's got the guts to do something, somebody who's wrestled a bear, something like that, right? That's what it takes. Israel had someone like that. Came right after Saul, in fact. Just a little kid. Same prophet Samuel. God had told him, look, I'm tired. I've rejected Saul. He's not listened. And so Samuel, he goes around and says, just you listen to me, and when you wind up somewhere, I'll tell you who the next king is. Well, there he is in Bethlehem, sitting at the table with Jesse. God says, it's one of Jesse's boys. All right. He says, all right, Jesse, uh, bring out your kids. 
And so here comes his sons. First one, now he looks like Saul. He's, in comp- he's sharp, man. Nice looking, got his hair cut and slicked back. Got a nice degree from the local college. He's a smart guy. Not him. All the way down the list. No, they get a little shorter, a little younger as they go. They get to the end. Jesse says, that's it. That's all I got. Samuel says, are you sure? He goes, well, I got one scrawny redheaded one out there looking after the sheep, but you don't want him. Bring him, bring him. God said it's one of yours. And then through the back door, stinking of sheep, old ruddy, red-headed David comes in. God says, Samuel, that's it. It's him. You know David. Took a sling and a rock, swung it over his head, and the Bible says when he let go of that rock, it sunk into the forehead of the Philistine giant champion named Goliath. And when he went to do it, no one in Israel would go. The whole army is lined up, and there's, there's Goliath out there just pacing back and forth, calling them sissies, all kinds of names in, in Hebrew and Philistine, Philistine, I'm sure. Walking back and forth, and here comes David, no armor, nothing. Just a little leather strap and five rocks he picked out of the river. Somebody says, David, you're crazy. What are you doing? Oh, I killed a bear and a lion looking after daddy's sheep. I can get this guy. That's what he said. David had grit, but you know he also had a softer side. Wrote most of the Psalms, played the harp. What do we call him? A man after God's own heart. They had a king like that. But there's other stories we know about David, aren't there? In 2 Samuel, it says, In the spring, in the time when kings rode off to war, David sent the army and stayed back home in Jerusalem. And one day he was walking on the roof of his palace when he peeped through the window of another woman's house. That's what the Bible says. Some reason we flipped that over. You know, some reason we put Bathsheba on the roof and said that she was tempting David. That's not what the Bible said. David was on the roof. He looked down, saw Bathsheba and said, bring her to my house. And he raped her and sent her home. Bible says she turned up pregnant. David said, can't have, this on, can't have this on me. The tabloids will be all over this. Brought her husband Uriah the Hittite home. Tried to get him drunk. Tried to send him home. He was too good. Didn't want to do it, so he sent him back into war. Had him on the front lines. Had the army retreat and killed him. Israel had a king who had grit and had guts. But that wasn't all it was. Wasn't the cleanest guy. Is that what it takes? Maybe we need something better for a good king. Maybe it takes wisdom. Wisdom to be a good king. Israel had a king like that. Came right after David. Solomon. There he was. Solomon, when he prayed to the Lord, he could have prayed for anything. Could have prayed for wealth, power. Could have prayed for might. Could have prayed to have everything. Instead, you know what he prayed for? Wisdom. He said, Lord, just give me wisdom. God said, I'll give you that and everything else. And Solomon, Solomon was great. Under Solomon, the nation grew. Under Solomon, the borders of the United Kingdom of Israel grew to the biggest they would ever be. Under Solomon, they were rich. They were wealthy. They were powerful. And under Solomon, they built a temple to God. But one of the things you might find interesting, if you read when Samuel builds the temple... And it says he built it so and so big. The very next verse, his palace was bigger. His palace was bigger. Solomon was wise, but he also kept a lot of wives and concubines, which some of us might argue is not so wise. But Solomon also let in foreign idols, built high places and altars to gods who did not exist, allowed all of these things to happen simply so the nation would be rich. And the economy would flourish. And things would be good. Turns out wisdom doesn't really make a great king. Because after Solomon, the nation divides and never, never comes back together. So what does it take? You can follow it all the way down. When it splits, there are all kinds of kings with all kinds of funny sounding names with way too many consonants and not enough vowels in them. You can follow the list all the way down. What does it take? None of them seem to be good. 
Some would say, oh, well, it takes a king who is committed to God and calls the people back to God. You know what? Judah had a king like that. His name was Josiah. Around the year 640, Josiah comes into play. Josiah decides, you know, this temple's looking pretty shabby. We need to have a capital campaign, raise some money. They go in, remodel the temple. His secretary comes back and says, look, king, look what I found, a codex, a book, the law. Turns out they hadn't been following it. Turns out they hadn't been listening to it. Josiah's heart broke and he rips his clothes, says, all right, that's it. Flevel all the high places. Tear down all the altars. Let's get back to the book. That's what he says. Let's start the festivals back. Let's observe the high holy days. Let's get rid of all this stuff. And they do. He's just three kings removed from our passage this morning. Doesn't stick. Because in the end, for Josiah, it turns out maybe it was nothing more than just personal piety. Just putting on, we're God's nation, let's be God's nation, let's do these things. And in the end, he still was all looking out for himself. And so then came the last three or four. There they were. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah, Jehoash. Those are great names, by the way. Here they are. And Jeremiah is prophesying to all of them. You kings have led the people astray. What does it take to be a good one then? If you look down the list, every quality you think ought to be there in a good king, you can find them in one, if not all, of the kings of Israel. And yet every single one of them failed. Every one of them. And here's the prophet calling them out. You've led the people astray. You destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. That's what he says. He talks about getting rid of them. Guess what, Zedekiah, whose name also has that little root about righteousness, Jeremiah giving a little dig in the side. You know what? It's not going to be your son. It's not going to be anybody down your line. I'm going to start the the line of David over. I'm starting it over. And this one's going to do it right. But what does it take? Maybe it's not about what they did do, but about what they didn't do. Maybe that's why God prophesies through Jeremiah. It's about not what the kings did, but what they didn't do. Jeremiah is not so clear about it, but but his contemporary Ezekiel is. Ezekiel is taken out of Judah prior to Jeremiah's time. He's He's in the first deportation under Nebuchadnezzar, led out of Judah and into Babylon. And Ezekiel prophesies using some of the same words to the kings in chapter 34. There it says, the word of the Lord came to me, mortal prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the sheep. And then hear what Ezekiel says. You have not strengthened the weak. You have not healed the sick. You have not bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strayed. You have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness you have ruled them. It's not what they did. It's what they didn't do. God had called them to lead God's people. Not to just be a figurehead, not to just make sure the coffers of the kingdom were full, not to just stretch the borders of the kingdom, not to make themselves and their friends comfortable, but to strengthen the weak, to bind up the wounded, to heal the sick. If I didn't know any better, that sounds like the words of Jesus. The first thing Jesus says after his baptism He goes into his home synagogue, opens the scroll, and says, I've come to proclaim the good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to proclaim, in a sense, the year of the Lord's jubilee. And he rolls the scroll up, sits down, and says, Today these words have been fulfilled in your hearing. It takes nearly 600 years, but it happens. Here Jeremiah proclaims against the kings of Israel, you've scattered them because of your selfishness. And it takes that long for that righteous branch of David 
to stand in a synagogue and say, today it's been fulfilled in your hearing. Do you know what that says to me? That, that it doesn't take charisma. It doesn't take grit. It doesn't even really take a lot of wisdom. What it takes to be a good king is the selfless love that can only come from God. What it takes, what it takes to be the king that God proclaims for his people is not a crown of gold, a crown of thorns. It is not a scepter, but a cross. That's where Jeremiah is pointing. He didn't even know it, but that's where he's pointing. It's not about another king who'll ride in on a chariot and say, all right, everybody else screwed it up, but I'm going to set it right. Because that one's going to fail. And the one after him is going to fail. And the one after him is going to fail. Every king, whether they wear a crown or a tie, whether they live in a castle or a mansion, whatever it is, every king will fail us every single time because none of them are Jesus. And so long as we pledge our allegiance to one a little more than the other, They'll fail us, and we will fail others. For we are called not to follow the kings of this world, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the one who is God's righteousness, the one whose birth we celebrate in just a few weeks, the one whose name ought always to be in our minds and on our hearts when we see others in need. May we be the people who seek to follow such a king, to do as the words of Ezekiel prophesy against those kings, but to make them right, to bind up the broken, to heal the sick, to seek after the lost, to care for one another. May we seek to be people who live into the words that the Lord is our righteousness and always seek to follow the one true King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords, help us to see, O oh God, when so many others fail us that you never do. Lord, help us to be faithful, faithful to you and you only. Lord, for when we put our faith and trust in others, it will only let us down. We know, God, that you never will. So, Lord, remind us of that truth through the words of Scripture, through the moving of your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, speak to us each day. Show us, God, how we may be your hands and feet in your kingdom to bring about your righteousness, to live as people who are truly submitted to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord Jesus, move in our midst now, we pray. Stir in our hearts. Speak to us. Have us to do and respond, Lord, in whatever way you would have us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.